from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2021 virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Uh, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon 21 and CloudNativeCon 21, part of the CNCF's annual event this year. It's virtual again. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, and we have two great guests from the CNCF. Cheryl Hung, VP of Ecosystems, and Katie Manji, who's the ecosystem advocate for CNCF. Thanks for coming on, great to see you. I wish we were in person soon, maybe in the fall. Cheryl, Katie, thanks for coming on. I'm definitely hoping to be back in person again soon, but John, great to see you and great to be back on theCUBE. You know, I have to say, one of the things that's really surprised me is the resilience of the community around um, what's been happening with the virtual and the COVID. Obviously, a lot of people have been and, um, you know, disrupted by this, but you know, the, the consensus is that developers have used to been working remotely and virtually and at home. And so not too much disruption, but a hell of a lot of productivity. You're seeing a lot more cloud native um, projects. You're seeing a lot more mainstreaming in the enterprise. You're starting to see cloud growth. Uh, just a really kind of nice growth. And you know, we've been saying for years, rising tide floats all boats, Cheryl, but this year you're starting to see real mainstream adoption with cloud native. And this has really been, part of the work of the community you guys have done. So what, what's your take on this? Because we're going to be coming out of the, this COVID pretty soon. There's a post COVID light at the end of the tunnel. What's your view? Yeah, definitely fingers crossed on that. I mean, I would love Katie to give her view on this in fact, because she came from Condé Nast and American Express, both huge companies that were adopting, have adopted cloud native successfully. And then in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of COVID, she joined CNCF. So Katie really has a view from the trenches and Katie would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely cloud native uh, adoption when it comes to the tooling has been more uh, prominent in the enterprises. And that has been confirmed with my role at American Express. That is the role I moved from uh, towards uh, CNCF. But the more surprising thing is that we see big companies, we see banks and financial organizations that are looking to adopt open source, but more importantly, they're looking or ways to either contribute or actually deep dive a bit more into these areas. So from that perspective, I've been pretty much at the nucleus of uh, enterprise ad adoption of cloud native. It's definitely moving, it's slow paced, but it's definitely forward moving as well. Um, and now I think while I'm in the role with CNCF as an ecosystem advocate and leading the end user community, there has been definitely uh, the community is growing. I'm always intrigued to find out more about the cloud native usages. One of the things that I find quite intriguing is the fact that not one cloud native usage, or like usage of Kubernetes or one platform, which is going to be cloud native based, is going to be the same. So it's always intriguing to find new use cases, to find those extreme use cases as well that really pushes the community forward. Yeah, I want to do a, um, unpack the end user aspect of this. And it's been a hallmark of the CNCF for years. It's always been a staple of the, the organization, but this year more than ever, it's been, seems to be prominent as people are integrating in. Uh, what about the growth? I mean, from last year, this year, and the use, end user ecosystem, how have you guys seen the growth? Is there any highlights? Do you guys have any stats and or observations around how the ecosystem is growing around the end user piece? Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, I can talk directly about CNCF and the CNCF end user community. Um, much like everything else, you know, COVID kind of slowed things down. So we we're kind of not entirely surprised by that, but we're still growing over 2020. And in fact, just in the last few months, it brought in some really, really big names like Peloton, Airbnb, Citibank, um, just some incredible organizations who are who have really adopted cloud native, who have seen the success and the benefits of it, and now are looking to give back to the community, as Katie said, get involved with open source and be more than just a passive consumer of the technologies, but actually become leaders in their own right. Katie, talk about the dynamic of developers at end user organizations. I mean, you've been there, you're now on, you've been on both sides of the table, if you will, not that the sides of the table, it's more like a round table, if you will, but community driven, but, you know, traditional uh, end user organizations, not the early adopters, not the hyperscalers, but the ones now are really embedding hybrid, um, are changing how IT to how modern applications being built. That's a big theme in these mainstream organizations. What's the dynamic going on? What's your view? I think for any organization, the, the kind of the core, what moves the organization towards cloud native is um, pretty much 
being ahead of your competitors. And now we have this mass of different organizations of cloud native. And that's why we see more kind of eyes towards this area. So um, definitely in this perspective, when it comes to, to the technology aspect, companies are looking to deploy complex application in an easier manner, especially when it comes to pushing them to production systems securely, faster, um, and continuously as well. They're looking to have this competitive edge when it comes to how can they quickly um, respond to customer feedback. And as well, they're looking for this um, hybrid element that has been, uh, has been talked about. Again, when we're talking about enterprise, it's not just about public cloud, it's about how can we run the application securely and that involves an element of data centers or private cloud as well. And now we see a lot of projects which are balancing around that age, but more importantly, there is adoption. And where there's adoption, there is a feedback loop and that's how what represents the organic growth. That's awesome. Cheryl, I'd like you to, to define what you mean when you say end user driven open source. What does that mean? Mm. This is a really interesting dynamic that I've seen over the last couple of years. So what we see is that more and more of the open source project are end users who are, who are solving their own problems and creating their own projects and donating these back to the community. An early example of this was uh, Envoy and Lyft and Jaeger from Uber. But Spotify also recently donated Backstage, which is a developer portal, which has really taken off. Um, we've also got examples from Intuit donating Argo. Um, I'm sure there are some others that I've just forgotten, but the really interesting thing I see about this is that class classically, right? Maybe a few years ago, if you were an end user organization, you'd get involved through a vendor. You'd go to a Red Hat or something and say, hey, you fix this on my behalf because you know, that's what I'm paying you to do. Whereas what I see now is end users saying, we want to keep this expertise in house and we want to be owners of our own kind of direction and our own fate when it comes to these open source projects. And that's been a big driver for this trend of open source and end user driven open source. You know, it's really the open model is just such a great thing. And I think one of the interesting thing is that uh, that fits in with a lot of people who want to work for mission driven companies, but here there's actually a business benefit as you pointed out, as in terms of the dynamic of bringing stuff to the community. This is interesting. I'm sure that the ability to do more collaboration, um, either hiring or contributing kind of increases when you have this end user dynamic because that's a pretty big decision to donate and bring something into the open source. What's the playbook? Well, if I'm sitting in an end user organization like American Express, Katie, or a big company say, hey, you know, we really developed this really killer use cases niche to us, but we want to bring it to the community. What do they do? Is there like a, is there like a, a manager? Do they knock on someone's door? Is there a repo? Is, I mean, how does someone, I mean, how does an end, end user get this done? Mm. Um, I think one of the best resources out there is called the To Do Group, which is a organization underneath the Linux Foundation. So it's kind of a sister group to CNCF, which is about open source program offices and how do you formalize such an open source program? Because it's pretty easy to say, oh, we'll just put something on GitHub, but that's not the end of the story, right? Um, if you want to actually build a community, if you want other people to contribute, then you do actually have to do more than just drop it on GitHub and walk away. So I would say that if you are at an end user company and you have created something which scratches your own itch and you think other people could benefit from it, then definitely come and like, you could email me, you could email Chris Anschick, who is the CTO of CNCF, and just get in touch and sort of ask around about what are the things that you could do in terms of what do you have to think about for licensing? How do you develop a community governance program? Um, yeah. Trademark issues? All of these things. It's interesting how open source is growing so much now. Chris has got so much action going on. New new verticals are opening up. You know, so so much action. Cheryl, you had posted on um, the internet uh, predictions for cloud native, which is, I found interesting because there's so much action going on. You had to break things out into pillars, tech, DevOps, and ecosystem. Each one kind of with a, a, a slew of, in, of key trends. So take us through the mindset. How, why break it out like that? You got tech, DevOps, and ecosystem. Traditionally that was all kind of bundled mm -hmm. in one. Why, why the pillars and is it because there's so much action? What, what's, what's the basis behind the prediction? Um, 
So originally, this was just a giant list of things that I had seen from talking to people and reading around and seeing what people were talking about on social media. Um, and when once I'd written out these 10, I thought about what does, what does this actually mean for the people who are going to look at this list um, and what should they care about? So I see tech trends as things related to tools, frameworks, um, perhaps architects. I see DevOps as people who are more as, as a combination of process, things that are a combination of process and people and culture, and best practices. And then ecosystem was kind of anything else broader than that, things that happen across organizations. So you can definitely go to my Twitter, you can go to Oy, at Oy Cheryl, O-I-C-H-E-R-Y-L, and take a look at this. And, you know, this is my list of 10. I would love to hear from you, whether you agree with it, whether you think there are other things that I've missed, or yeah, what would your 10? Well, I'd love, I love the top. Well, first of all, I think the list is very relevant. The one that I would ask you on is more Rust and Cloud Native. That's the number one item. Um, I think cross cloud is definitely totally happening. I think people are really starting to think about that. And I, so I'd love to get your comments on that. But I think the thing that jumped out at me was the DevOps piece, because this is a trend that I've been seeing a lot more, certainly even in academic um, institutions for folks in school, right? Um, going to college for computer science and engineering, this idea of SRE, um, large scale cloud, is not so much an IT practice, it's much more of a cloud native mindset. So I think this idea of, of ops, so much more about scale. And I use SRE only because I don't can't think of a better word around it. And certainly the edge piece is with Kubernetes, I think is, is the, I think the biggest story to me, that's where all the action seems to be when I talk to people around mm -hmm. what they're working on in terms of training new people, onboarding and whatnot. Katie, you're shaking your head. You're like, yeah, what's your thoughts? I have definitely been uh, through all of these stages from having a team where the DevOps, I think it's more of a culture of like a pattern to adopt within an organization more than anything. So I've been pre DevOps within DevOps and actually during the evolution of it where we actually added an SRE team as well. Um, I think having these uh, cultural changes within an organization, they are necessary, especially if they want to iterate, iterate quicker and actually deliver value to the customers with minimal latency. Because what it actually adopts, there is the collaboration between teams which were initially segregated. And that's why I think there is a paradigm nowadays, which is called DevSecOps, which actually moves security more towards left. This has been very popular, especially in the, in the latest uh, couple of months, lots of talks around it. And even there is like a security collocated event of KubeCon, which is going to focus on that mainly. Um, but as well within the, uh, the DevOps area, um, one of the models that has been quite prominent has been GitOps as well, which pretty much uses the power of Git repositories to describe the state of the applications, how it actually should be within the production system. And within the cloud native ecosystem, there are two main tools that pretty much lead this area. And there's going to be Argo CD, which has been donated by Intuit, which is our end user. And we have a Flux as well, which has been donated by Weaveworks. And both of these projects currently are within the incubation stage, which pretty much by default um, showcases there is a lot of adoption from the organizations, um, more than 100 of, for, for some of them. So there is wider adoption. Um, another thing that I would like to mention is the GitOps working group, which has emerged um, I think between KubeCon Europe and North America last year. And that again is more to define a manifesto of how exactly GitOps pattern should be adopted within organizations. So there is a lot of, I would say initiatives and this is further I would say confirmed with the tooling that we have within the ecosystem. Yeah, that's really awesome insight. I want to just, you know, if you don't mind, follow up on that. Why is GitOps so important right now? Is it because the emphasis of security? Is it the emphasis of more scale? Is it just, I mean, because it pretty much Git was, okay, it's just codes storing it over there. Is it because there's so much more inspection going on around it? I mean, code reviews have been going on for a long time. What's, what's the big deal? Why is it so hot right now in your opinion? I think there are definitely a, a couple of aspects that are quite important. You mentioned security, that's definitely one of them. With the GitOps pattern, there is a pull model rather than a push model. So you have the actual tool, for example, Argo City or Flux, watching for a repository, and if new changes are identified, it's going to pull those changes automatically. So the first thing that we actually can see from this model is that we always will have a delta between what's within our Git repositories and the production system. Usually, if you have a pull model, you can pull it, uh, you can push the changes towards 
dev staging environment, but not always the production because you have the change window mm -hmm. sometimes. With, um, with the GitOps model, you'll always be aware of what's the delta and you have quite a nice way to visualize that, uh, especially with Argo City, which has a UI as well. As well with the GitOps pattern, there is uh, less necessity to share the credentials with the actual pipeline tool. All of, because Argo and um, Flux, they are natively built around Kubernetes, all, all the secrets are gonna be residing within the cluster. There is no need to share any extra credentials or any extra permissions with external tools as well. There is scale, there is, um, again, with Kid, we have historical data points, which uh, allows us to easily revert um, to uh, stable points of the applications in the past. So multiple, multiple um, benefits, I would say, but definitely secured. I think it's one of the, the main one and it, it has been talked about quite a lot as well. You know, a lot of these end user stories kind of revolve around these dynamics and uh, the ones you guys are promoting and from your members, as well as in the community at large is, uh, I hate to use the word uh, day two operations, but that really is the issue. Like, okay, we're up and running. I want more automation. This is a GitOps kind of vibe here where it's like, okay, we got to go troubleshoot all this. Wait, it should be working. As more stuff comes in, this becomes more and more the dynamic. Is that, is that because of just more edges, more things, more <laughs> devices? What's, what's, the, what's the push behind all these stories around this automation and day two operation things. What's the, what do you guys think? I think I think the expectations are getting higher and higher, to be honest. A few years ago, it was enough to use containers and start using the barest minimum, you know, to orchestrate those containers. But now what we see is that, you know, it's easy to choose a technology. It's easy to install it and even configure it. But as you said, John, those day two operations are really, really hard. Um, for example, one of the ones that we've seen up and coming and we care about a lot from CNCF is Kubernetes on the edge. And we see this as enabling telco use cases and 5G and IoT and really, really broad, difficult use cases that just a few years ago would have been nigh on impossible. The interesting I mean, Katie, you also- Katie, what's your sorry, thoughts Katie, on Katie, you also talk about edge, right? Absolutely. I think I, I really like to watch uh, some of the talks at KubeCon, especially given by the big organizations that have to manage thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers, and they have to deliver a cluster to these, to these teams. Now, from their point of view, they pretty much have to manage clusters at scale. There is definitely the edge out there, and they really kind of pushing the technology towards how can we get closer to the physical devices within the customer's kind of um, uh, let's say bubble or um, area and surface. So edge has been definitely something which uh, has been moving a lot when it comes to the cloud native ecosystem. We've had a lot of projects moving to towards the incubation stage. K3S has been there um, for, for a while and again, has a lot of adoption, is known for its stability. But another thing that I would like to mention is that now currently we have a lot of projects that are edge focused, but within sandbox. So there is again, a lot of potential. If there is going to be a higher demand for this, I would expect these tools to move from sandbox to incubation and even graduation. So that's definitely something which um, uh, it's moving and there is dynamism around it. Well, Cheryl, Katie, you guys are awesome. Love the work you're doing. I got to ask the final question since you brought it up about the expectations, Cheryl. If you guys could both end the segment with the comment around expectations as the industry and companies and developers and participants continue to grow. What, what's changed with CNCF, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, as the expectation has been growing and the stakes are higher too, frankly. I mean, you got security, you mentioned these things, edge, um, GitOps, you start to see the maturation of this ecosystem. What's new and what's expected of you guys? What do you see and, and how are you guys organizing? I think we can definitely say the ecosystem has matured a lot compared to a few years ago. Same with CNCF, same with KubeCon. I think the very first KubeCon I went to was Berlin, which was about 1800 people. Um, just kind of mind boggling to see how much, it, how much it's grown since then. I mean, one of the things that we try and do is to expand the number of people who can reach the community. So for example, we launched Kubernetes Community Days and we launched that, that means community organized events in Africa. 
for example, for people who couldn't come to large events in North America or Europe. Um, we also are launching things to help students. Um, I actually love talking to students because quite often now you talk to them and they say, oh, I've never run software in anything other than a container. And you're like, yeah. whoa, this was a new thing. This is brand new a few years ago. And now like you can be 18 and have never tried anything exactly. else. Um, so it's pretty amazing. But yeah, there's definitely, there's always space to grow the community. Yeah, I mean, once you go cloud native, it's like, you know, like, ah, you've never loaded Linux on a server before? I mean, what, what's going on? <laughs> Katie, give me your thoughts as expectations go higher and certainly there's more in migration, not only for young folks, because they're jumping into this because it's engineering meets computer science. It's now cross discipline. You're seeing scale, you mentioned scaling up. Those are huge factors. Um, you got younger, you got cross training, you got cybersecurity, I mean, and you got FinTech ops that Chris is working on. I mean, so much is happening. What, what's your, what, how you guys keep up? What's your, how are you going to raise them? Absolutely. I think uh, there's definitely technology moving forward, but I think nowadays there is a more need for actual end user stories. While it's the uh, beginning of KubeCons, uh, there is a lot of focus on the technical aspects. How can you fix this particular problem of uh, deploying between two clusters or deploying at scale? There is like a lot of technical aspects. Nowadays, they're looking for the stories because as I mentioned before, not one platform is going to be the same when it comes to cloud native. And I think there's still, uh, the community is still trying to look for some patterns or some standards. And we actually can see like, especially when it comes to the open standards, we can see this moving within um, the observability stack, the application delivery, where we have, for example, cross-plane and Kubella. We have open metrics and open tracing as well, which focuses on observability. And all of the interfaces that we had around um, Kubernetes bridge service mesh and so forth. All of these pretty much try to bring a benchmark, making it easier to integrate these special use cases um, when it comes to actual extreme technology kind of solutions that you need to provide. And um, I was mentioning the end user stories that are they're more in demand nowadays, mainly because these are very, very necessary from the community, like for example, the SIGs or the project maintainers, they require feedback to actually move forward. And as part of that, I would like to mention that we've uh, recently soft launched the end user lounge, which really focuses on this particular aspect of end user stories. We try to uh, pretty much question our end users and really understand what really moved them to adopt cloud native, what keeps them on this path and what like future challenges they would like to um, to tackle or are they facing at the moment they would like to solve in the future. So we're trying to create this feedback loop between the end users and the, the projects out there. So I think this is something which needs to be a bit more closely together these two spheres, which currently are segregated, but we, we're trying to, uh, to solve that. Awesome, you guys do great work, great job. Cheryl, to wrap us up real, take a minute to put a plug in for the CNCF and the ecosystem. What's the fashion this year? What's hot? What's the trend? What are you guys doing? Share some quick update on what's going on in the ecosystem from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, the ecosystem, even though I just said that we're maturing, you know, the growth has not stopped. Now what we're seeing is these, you said, as Katie was saying, you know, more specific use cases, even bigger, even more demanding environments. Um, even more kind of crazy use cases. I mean, I, I love the story from the US Department of Defense about putting Kubernetes on their fighter jets and putting Istio on fighter jets. You know, it's just absurd to think about it. Um, but I would say definitely come and be part of the community, um, share your stories, share what you know, help other people. Um, if you are an end user of these technologies, then go to cncf.io slash end user um, and just come and be part of our community, you know, meet your peers and hear what everybody else is doing. Well, having Kubernetes and Istio on jets, that's the Air Force. I would call that tactical edge, Katie, to you know, bring, bring <laughs> back the edge. Cheryl, Katie, nice. thank you so much for sharing the insight. Ecosystem is robust. Rising tide is floating all the boats, as we always say here on theCUBE. It's been great to watch and continue to watch the rise. I think it's just the beginning. We're starting to see post pandemic visibility, cloud native, more standards, more visibility into the economics and value. And great to see the ecosystem rising up with the end users as well. So congratulations and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, John. It's a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank okay. you for having us, John. Great to have you on. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here for KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 21 virtual. Soon we'll be back in real life. Thanks for watching.